attention now needs to turn to what does recovery look like and where does tourism feature within that um, recovery and indeed the opening up of the economy. The initial uh, perspective and where tourism featured was incredibly underwhelming. We were, our, our contribution uh, to the economy was, was totally undervalued. And the earliest that we are, are looking at from, from uh, perspectives that came through from government were December and then into, into next year. The webinar we had yesterday was, was a hard hitting one. We had some good people on that webinar, Rob Moore, Dave Ryan, um, amongst others. And, and they had quite a, key, a clear message is that we need to open up earlier, we need to open up safe, uh, safely, and in essence, how do we do that? So in a, in a sense, that tees up the what for us, but it doesn't mean that a whole lot of other activities and other um, elements of recovery can't be progressed at the same time. So that was, the, was, was, was really the Gauteng um, uh, northern part of the country perspective. It's interesting to see our, our colleagues on, on, on the southern tip are going to respond. And, and knowing the panelists, I think we're in for a really useful discussion. So let me, without further ado, introduce, introduce who is with us this afternoon. Um, Ilana Clayton, who is our Western Cape SATSA chair and has done a great job um, in that capacity over, over the last years. She's also the CEO of Travel Smart Crew. We also have Monica Yule, who's the Vice Chair of SATSA in the Western Cape and is the CEO at Private Safaris. We have Gavin Reynolds, who has um, kicked his wife upstairs to the Executive Chairman role and has taken over as CEO at Spirit of Africa. Um, we've got Peter Dross, who chairs our, West, uh, our Garden Route chapter um, and has done an amazing job in that um, that part of the world, also serves on, on, on the SATSA board and is the sales and marketing director at Pancourt. And then we have Moggy Whitehouse, who has been an amazing addition to the team down at Wesgro. She's taken over as the chief tourism officer and has really just brought an, an amazing perspective, gravitas and a sense of action and urgency to, to, to that portfolio. And then what we've tried to do, guys, in, in, in um, the sessions yesterday, we had Ines Batz from DAT Touristic in Germany to give us a perspective from the German market. And we're really fortunate enough to have um, a long-standing friend of South Africa, former SA Tourism, well, in those days, I think it was Sato Jules, uh, used to run the Sato office in, in, in the States, but has been running his own tour operator for over 20 years, Premier Tours from Philadelphia, and he's a member of Safari Professionals. So... Julian's going to give us a perspective from, from um, the US. Before we get into the substance of it, I just want to give people a sense of what, what this process is, is, is about and, and how we are, are seeking to pull in information and opinions from all SATSA members and indeed those people who might be tuning into the webinar who aren't SATSA members. We are trying to pull in a perspective on the inbound industry about what recovery should look like. But it's important that we channel that together with our, with our public sector partners. And the appropriate way that we've done it is to, I'm just going to put a graphic up which just sort of explains this quite, quite clearly. Um, if you just have a look at that, what we're trying to do is to pull, funnel everything up through the Tourism Business Council. We, we're meeting tomorrow with Cesar and Shauna and the SAT guys. And our proposal is that we set up uh, an SAT TBCSA Partnership to Recovery Steering Committee. And we're keeping it very simple. There are three key components. We, we're on the inbound side, and we speak specifically for inbound. Then you've got domestic and outbound. There's some debate about whether those should be split, but we've got them together for the, um, for the uh, uh, purposes of, of our initial discussion. And then we've got aviation and, and access, which is obviously a key component. And a lot of these feed into each other, but we need to break the problem into its bite-sized chunks. And what we're seeking to do in the runway to recovery is through the thought leadership of, of panelists in the various uh, regions and, and in, in the various days this week is to catalyze and stimulate your thoughts around what recovery uh, should look like, what are the key elements, and how we should go about conveying this message through to the highest powers that be. It, is, it would be that much more powerful if we do this together with our, with our public sector partners. And, and, and indeed, that's what our, our, our meeting tomorrow with SAT is about. We're looking at 
putting together a sensible structured engagement that can that can um, have a structure in which these opinions are then channeled channeled up to uh, um, um, through to the minister and through the minister into into cabinet and into the uh, uh, command control uh, echelons. So, with that being said, let, let's get into the substance of uh, our, our discussion today. Um, and I'm just going to just go to the to the various panels just for some sort of opening remarks from 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 their perspective on on the recovery thing. Given our discussions yesterday, where should we be taking things forward? So, Ilana, as the as the chair of uh, Western Cape, and and because you've got a cool background, let's start with you. You want to just unmute yourself? Hi, there? yeah. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Hi. Um, right. Um, so, <laughs> where to start? I think I've got a very different approach on the on the recovery model, and recovery is something that that has been in my scope from the very beginning of this, having not been as strongly involved in the operation, yet more in the future picture on the supplier contracting and product side. So you know, from, a, from a recovery point of view, recovery strategy is very prevalent in day-to-day in, in -day life for me at the moment. Um, and I think this forum where we can start discussing some of the more positive things, the reinvention and adaptation of our industry um, and laying down this, this foundation, this runway for you know, what will be tourism um, when, when it comes back. So I think these sorts of, of, of collaborative discussions, starting to get ideas um, from, from practitioners in the sector is, is helpful. And yeah, our first port of call, I think we need to look at, at, the, at the consumer. As long as we've got a consumer, we've got a, um, we've got a, we've got a future. And I think that it all starts with the consumer. What's the, the new consumer behavior? What's the consumer wanting? And how do we, how do we talk to that consumer going forward? Great. Thanks. So uh, that's short and sharp and, 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 and to the point, and we'll, we'll certainly get into that discussion as the afternoon um, unfolds. Monica, can we turn to you and, uh, um, Thanks, David. Um, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, wow. Crazy times, right? Um, I think just taking a lead on from um, what Ilana was saying, I think the, the most important and the most constructive thing for us to do right now is to start thinking about ways towards a recovery um, of the industry, but also opportunities for reform. There are also, though, some, I want to take a little bit of a, a leaf from yesterday's book. Um, some of the conversations that were being have, had there. I think that um, we have precedents around the world of other destinations who acknowledge that the upcoming season for them from a tourism industry perspective is the lifeblood of the rest of the year. So if you look at what Greece is doing, if you look at what Spain is doing in terms of their successful ability to convince their governments that there needs to be a safe way for them to be able to open up their beach holiday um, um, destinations, because if they don't have um, bookings for the remainder of the summer, the European summer, that's the entire year pretty much gone. And it's the same in South Africa, right? So Q4 in South Africa is the, is the quarter which generates a lot of the cash and a lot of the revenue that gets a lot of businesses through the leaner months. Um, and losing Q4, Whilst the length of the runway is a problem, the fact that Q4 is at the end of the runway is, I think, particularly problematic. And, but as I said, I think the opportunity for us from an from a intervention perspective is to see if we can convince our governments, like other countries have already done, um, to convince them that there is a big opportunity for us to open up our high season. Thank Great. you. Um, Marx, can we turn to you? and? Uh... Just get a perspective from uh, from from your side, from West Coast uh, point of view, um, on on how, how we take things forward. Thank you, Davi. I didn't expect to be so soon in the picking order. I think I have the singular honour of being the only government person in any of your webinars, Davi. 
Yes, at least not, not in happy. That's, so thank that's you for that. Quite correct. We, we, have, have, uh, we have Nomans Nomasanto and Glovo joining us from uh, uh, the. Okay, it's so one of two. Thank you, Doug, for one of, one of one two. Of no pressure in terms of that. Um, but yeah, so I expect you to speak last in terms of it. Um, so following on what, what Monica is saying works quite perfectly, because what I have called out, um, WESCRA is a unique agency in that we are not just tourism, we are investment and we are export focused as well. And what I've pulled out and want to share at a later stage when it's appropriate, is some of the lessons that we learned around lobbying government and lobbying government successfully from the work that we have done in the Western Cape. Um, and I think it's incredibly pertinent to have that conversation now following in what Monica, on, on what Monica said, because we need to make sure that the submissions and the work that we've done as a collective are heard. And the first point, and I'm very happy that you shared that slide at the start, Darby, because the first thing that we learned moving from level five into level four was that associations are the only bodies that are heard. So it doesn't matter who goes and lobbies, no matter how important they are in the corporate world, the private sector, no matter what their, their corporate business turns over or employs, it's the association who's seen as the collector that needs to lobby. So the fact that you're working with TBCSA is just perfect. How then we package what TBCSA, is, TBCSA takes forward is what's going to be essential for us now moving from level four into level three. So I'm being pragmatic for a change, which will surprise you all. But at, at some point, there literally is a list of what we need to do. Right now, in TBCSA, on that portal that they announced at the webinar on Monday, there are over a thousand submissions. 53% um, of the Western Cape, I'm not competitive, but hey, 53% are the Western Cape. Um, and they'll be expecting significantly more going forward. I have checked in with them to say what happens at the back end of that, and it is, it's an agglomerator. They'll be able to divide those into the different areas. But the important thing for you, David, and for the SATSA team is to then work on how that gets packaged into a very simple, comprehensive submission in each of the areas for us to have a chance to change what the length of that runway to keep the to keep the conversation going. So that's the one thing that I do want to touch on at a later stage. The other thing that I'm fixated with is air access. And I don't think air access is getting enough airtime. So I'm delighted again that it's one of your um, key, key areas. Air access is a major um, concern of ours. If you look at, um, in America, for example, after the 2008 financial crash, when Cleveland and um, Pittsburgh lost their hubbing ability because they lost their, their ability to be able to, to drive from an airlift perspective, it fundamentally changed not just those cities, but those, those um, states. And I think we need to be very careful about, and I'm not just talking here from about Cape Town, I'm talking Joburg, because Joburg is a hub into Africa. And if Oliver Tamba loses that opportunity, the impact not just for tourism in South Africa, but for Sub-Saharan Africa is significant. So that's something that we really need to get fixated about because airlift, given um, the, the priority, or, or the lack of priority of tourism, airlift, is very firmly um, packaged with that and it is not being seen as as critical as it is and we need to find a different dare i say narrative you know i love all our new words we've gone from narrative to de-risk if you have a sentence and you can do narrative and de-risk and level the playing fields you're banging you've got everyone listening to you so those are my two areas and i don't want to want, want to um yeah great look we'll we'll, we'll come at back whatever to point we can have a, a conversation and get input no, no, great. Thanks for highlighting that. We'll, we'll, we'll certainly come back to that. Gav, can I turn to you um, on your, your opening remarks? Yeah, there you go. Thanks, David, and thanks for inviting me onto this panel. Um, so my, uh, my contribution is mostly focused on, on how do we go about solving this problem and, and, and linking a bit more thinking towards towards how do we package this to TBCSA to take to government. So just a couple of points that I'd like to briefly touch on. So I like to position my thinking in a sort of design thinking framework, talking to the past, the present and the future. It helps me sort of structure my thoughts and, and strategies and, and it briefly goes as follows. It says forget the past, manage the present and create the future. Um, and 
it, it helps us to develop strategies for each of us. You know, it, it avoids bringing the past into the present. Um, it's, it avoids conversations around expecting the future to be like it was in the past. Um, and then how we need to be as an industry to get there is, is, is collaborative. And, and I've got some thoughts about, about how to collaborate successfully. Um, that's all I wanted to say for now, yeah. Great, Gav. Well, we'll, we'll, as I say, we'll, we'll certainly get into that. Uh, Pedro, can we hand over to you and uh, give us your thoughts um, from Fancourt? Maybe also, you know, you're part of the Sales Forum, which is a, a, a really, uh, you know, great group of, of, of hotels and lodges. So, yeah, I look forward to your, your perspective. Thanks, David. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, I think just as an opening remark from me would, would be, you know, the last six weeks have und undoubtedly changed the world, obviously. But if you looked at businesses that were marginal, it's just expedited that process dramatically. So I'm thinking of publishing and airlines and all those sort of things. And it's going to have the exact same effect on us and how we do business. And, um, but what, is, what does that mean? And I, and I still think we, we don't quite know. We're dabbling there and trying to get our head around it because what we learned a week ago or two weeks ago is not the same as next week or maybe even in, in two weeks' time. So I think as we journey through this process, we're going to learn new things and we're going to have to find new ways of doing business. It's tourism unusual. And there, there's, no question, there's no question about that. Um, and I think we'll delve a bit more into that as, as we go along. Then just to touch on Margie's point, I mean, she's, she's spot on. As much as we want to get ready and you know, have our packages and pricing and, and all those sort of things sorted, if no one's flying, no one's coming. Um, so she's spot on. We've got to get that right. We've got to understand that. And we've got to work closely with that to make sure that we are aligned. But I think as a united front, we've got to get our timing right for all these individual actions and activities. And whenever the, the trigger gets pulled or we're on the runway and the plane takes off, we need to be all firing on, on the same cylinders. And I think now's the opportunity to start building towards that to make sure when the plane does take off that, we're, that we are aligned. And there's lots of discussions to be held in those various compartments. So let's leave that for now. Thank you. Thanks, Pete. Really good. Okay, Jules, uh, you've heard, heard the, uh, the, the sort of collective views. Um, nothing's going to happen if uh, customers in our, in, our, in our main source markets don't have an appetite to travel. So, yeah, let's, let's get your input. Well, hi, everyone. And thank you, David, and your team for putting this um, discussion together and, and for inviting me to speak on behalf of Safari Pros. I think we're living in certainly unprecedented times. And um, by putting our heads together and, and, you know, having these type of discussions, I think we can get to a point where we can strategize and find solutions uh, to hopefully get us to the end of that uh, tunnel and see some light in the not too distant future. Um, the obvious thing, I know everybody has discussed it yesterday, is the big elephant in the room, namely the unrealistic timeline for, for reopening. I think um, one of the biggest problems that, that South Africa is going to face is the fact that the neighboring countries and, and the East African countries are all gearing up for, a, for a, an opening in the near future. Um, and given the fact that we've got, you know, Margie mentioned um, airlift, the fact that you've got two airlines flying out of the US into, into East Africa, namely Nairobi and Addis, um, this vacuum is gonna give them plenty time to start establishing these routes for themselves. And I think you know, when South Africa does reopen, potentially it's gonna be a lot harder to get yourself back to that same footing that where you were in the, in, in the African market. So those are all things that um, you know. Hopefully, we can discuss today and and um, and try to find solutions to. I think one of the other points that I would like to raise, particularly from a, an American perspective, is once things are all open, you know, there still needs to be that. There's still going to be that fear, particularly because a lot of our demographics are older in the older brackets, and they are going to need to be reassured on on that, you know how things are, you know, what sorts of safety aspects of, of travel. So I look forward to, uh, um, you know, a fruitful discussion. Thank you. Great. Well, look, let's, you know, just in terms of breaking out, there were, there were some, lots of good points from, from everybody, but let's, so let's 
let's get the whole how thing out of the way and 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 get into that to to start with. Yeah? You know, yesterday I think there was unanimity in 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 the panel, and certainly it's something that I think the TBC has said through through Chafiwa as the CEO have, have have given quite a strong message that December's too late. So then it's a question of if people are willing to travel and airlines are willing to fly and we can do this safely, how do we make this how do we make this happen? So let me go back to you, Margie. You had some some quite clear thoughts around the lobbying thing, and then Gavin, I'll 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 I'll, I'll come to you after that. And then if anybody else just raise your hand, um, um, get, get over my technically challenged self, I'll acknowledge you, <laughs> take it forward. But Marks, you just, you kick off on, on some thoughts about how we can successfully try and get this lobbying thing. Because a lot of people out there are thinking, well, I've made a submission, you know, and it, it, you know, how do we channel this collective voice through in a productive way? Okay, so I'm going to bust you, dive in front of everyone, because we only just taught David how to lift his hand on Zoom. So just when he says technical, technologically talented, he really means it. He's not being coy. Um, I, I've been watching the group chat, and there have been a couple of questions around how we're interacting with our other um, sectors and the other industries in terms of learning lessons from them. And that's exactly what I want to talk about. Because Wesco is in the unique position of working across the entire um, spectrum of, of of export and manufacturing and all the industries. Um, I, pull, I got the team to pull together just some, and this is not, this is the le lessons we learn from lobbying in general, not Wesco lobbying. So I'm not trying to be territorial about it. It's how did we, what was the lobbying that went on from movements from level five into level four and who won and why did they win? Because that's what's critical for us. So there were 55 specific issues that, um, that went forward and 17 got an outright win. And you might not think that's high, but for us in tourism, if we could get anything like that, we would be very happy, yeah? Um, and so the, these were issues that weren't even on the regs, that weren't even being looked at the regs, just to give you some hope in terms of saying that there are ways in which we can do it. There are ways in which we can de-risk and put it forward. Um, and when we looked at what the, the, the industries had done, I, I mentioned the biggest one, and that's working through your association because they have the credibility that they are broad-based and represent the entire industry. Absolutely critical. But then what else goes into it? It's, it's everything that you all have been talking about, but it needs to get packaged in one. It's the economic impact. So we, we, and we're talking value, we're talking job creation, we're talking tax. We haven't often talked about the tax um, recently in terms of what tourism does. It's risk management. So this whole issue around de-risking, and I know some people are saying, well, who haven't come forward on airline protocols? As we speak, like an hour ago, um, the um, Airlines for Europe just signed an agreement with the ECC on how to de-risk airlines. That's a massive step for us to give the international credibility on how we can de-risk airlines. We don't need to reinvent it. It's been done for us because Europe are ahead of the curve of us. So something like that is important. Talking of that, we've got to look at um, global impact and participation. So I know we're all anxiously working, uh, watching how Europe is opening up, and Monica talks about Turkey, and talks about Greece, but it has an impact on our government psyche as well, seeing as the world opens up, that it can be done safely, that there isn't another uh, a W shape to the curve and move forward. Obviously, clear objectives. It's got to be an entire sector submission as well. So that's why it's going to be so important, David, how you work with TVCSA to be able to package these in bite-sized chunks. And it's also got to be really simple. So the, the, the submissions that went through that one were literally two pages that put it out succinctly, clearly, and showed the level of gravitas in which they're taking the situation and being able to set it to government. And then the, there is the thing around um, leveraging media for support that is interesting. Um, we are seen as an emotional, quite volatile industry, and um, that does not work in our favor in lobbying. So we need to find some ways of getting gravitas behind the economic positioning of tourism um, to balance that with the social distancing. So I guess in summary, it's saying if we can, sh we know that the economic story is, is there, but we balance the economic story with an international world-based practice of social distancing. And then maybe 
and this is literally just something I've thought about now as, as, as the group has been talking, maybe we find ways to test it, to prove, just to show proof of purchase. That's not going to excite everyone in the industry because we want to open it up and, and have, a, have a full summer, summer happening. But maybe there's a way in which we can actually test along the way, start some, some international flights and see how the tourists move right through the, the, the tourism curve and do it in a way that is completely safe. To, to, to de-risk it in the minds of government. Great, very, very, very useful and, and, and sort of like the way that you broke, broke those things into the, just into the constituent uh, elements. Gav, do you want to come in? No, thanks, David. Um, and, and, and dovetailing exactly into what Margie was saying. So, David, you know me that I've got a very sort of practical way of thinking about things and, and, and I like to think in pictures. So um, my approach would be to uh, as follows. The first step is to convince government of the size of the headache. Okay, how much pain they are about to go through, the country's about to go through if we fail um, in keeping tourism alive. So convince them of the size of the headache, create hope, and then provide them for the solution, little tablet, this is gonna solve your headache. So let me break that down a little bit. There are not many things that we know. One of the things that we do know is the scenario document that was discussed yesterday in the uh, SAT, TVC, SA webinar. So we can work with that. My approach would be to, to plot the current trajectory of the, of the industry against that timeline in a visual document that's easy to understand with timelines and, 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 and specific intervals and saying, if by this date we, we continue a current trajectory, this is how many jobs we're possibly going to lose. This is what's going to happen to, to export revenue, et cetera, et cetera, all the way to, to where we currently are, where, where the borders are only going to open around February next year. Then we can also plot in terms of hope. Okay, so that, that explains the size of the headache and, 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 uh, and gives some tangible numbers to if the current strategy is, is, uh, is insisted on, what we're likely to look at. Hope is in a form of, of um, what do we know, and this is a working document, we continue updating it, what do we know about different countries, our source market starting to open up? We can say this date, these guys are coming online, at that day, these guys are coming online. So we can start creating hope in terms of this is the demand that's busy building up, potentially wanting to travel to our country. So there's, there's two forces here. There's the, on our side, South Africa, there's our internal economic and social um, 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 forces driving for, for uh, opening up, otherwise um, the, the industry is gonna collapse. And then there's the force of the demand starting to build up. And if we can plot those, on the graph, on the same graph, using what we have. We can start getting a picture, a visual picture of what, what might be possible. And in the solution, the little magical tablet's gonna make the headache go away, is, is here's what, as an as a industry, we can do to solve the problem. These are the protocols. These are the international protocols that's been developed already um, to reduce fear, reduce risk, increase hope. Um, they need to be realistic, well-considered, and convincing and then to be collaborative as in the conversation if we do this first then this can happen and then this can happen and in a way that we present it with a couple of alternatives um, uh, and and allowing for for unintended consequences um, because it is a complex situation and there, there's if we propose certain things to happen in our industry there's not going to affect in other industries or under other aspects of their plan that we might not be aware of that we need to be mindful of um, so, so the question is like, how do we do something like this effectively? Uh, it, it's it's going to have to be based on data. It's a, a lot of that information we probably already have, and whatever assumptions we make to to plot the timeline, the trajectory of the of the the current trajectory of the industry against that timeline, we would need to make sure that's based on fair and reasonable and verifiable science. So it's a database exercise. Um, it's it's visual. Um, it uh, it it. It's, it's collaborative, it gives the government solutions to the problem once we've convinced them how big the problem is. Great, 
Can I, can I just pose a question to, to anybody else who wants to come in? Because, you know, it's, I think it, 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 it would certainly inform and guide um, how we actually take our lobbying voice forward. And the point I made yesterday, and I was on the CNBC thing, and I made that as well. You know, we've had the survey, the IFC survey and NDT survey, which we put up in the webinar, but that was done in literally the first 30 days. The situation is, is and I think, Peter, you said it quite eloquently, and it's changing. The situation today is going to be different to next Tuesday. It's moving very, very quickly forward. And the lockdown that we went into was based on a particular reading of this problem. It was driven by the Department of Health, and then we got the levels. Do we accept that? Because there's been, and I think everybody is seeing in, in the sort of social media space, that there are alternative and new voices coming to the fore about how we should be viewing um, an overall response to the uh, to the sort of virus crisis, and then obviously that would inform how you, you know how you could possibly open up. So, do we accept the straitjacket of level five, four, three, and and simply try and get ourselves down, or do we hitch ourselves to alternative views on 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 how this uh, should be be sort of managed? Um, you know, I think that that. That's a, a sort of key question for all of us. Does anybody anybody got any views on that? So Mon's got her hand up. Mon, do you want to unmute yourself? <laughs> yeah. Saw that. Thanks. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> the actual hand or the virtual hand? Um, thanks, David. Um, so I've got a little bit of an opinion about that, if I may. So you did say yesterday that I'm always good for one, so here it goes. Um, <laughs> so um, I think that there is some compelling narrative that's happening in social media and in media in general around whether these lockdown levels are actually still relevant, whether the models that were originally used by um, the prof and the department were um, even still true, you know, two months later. And I think that there's, there's a lot of merit in a lot of that conversation. I think, though, that if we as a tourism industry want to set ourselves the target of joining a camp that is vocal around changing the entire methodology and the entire framework that this anti-COVID um, strategy is based on. I think we're probably going to be trying to bite off the whole, eat the whole elephant in one go. And I think that's really the problem. The challenge that we have on the other hand though, and I saw Honor's com comments in the, in the chat, the challenge that we have in the tourism sector specifically is that everything is connected. So it's it's really difficult to to you know choose which 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 sectors we would lobby for in level three. So because if you open car hire companies but you don't have airlift yet, then who's going to be hiring the cars? And if you open up the guest houses but you don't open up wine sales, then you know who's going to come over for dinner? And if you don't, you know, so that everything is interconnected. So you are going to have to make some really strange decisions. But in my personal opinion, we have to find incremental and impactful ways to make a difference rather than try and go at the ch charging at the at the entire thing. Gav, you wanted to come back? Yeah, so 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 um, adding to what Monica says, so 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 it really is in a, in a lot of ways a conversation, a, a process of how do we move the conversation forward? So how do we improve where we currently are? Because currently it's pretty dire. We may not be able to open up everything in one go, but, but it's our responsibility and our job to, to lay out the interconnectedness of the industry. We can't just assume and say it's all interconnected and therefore you must open it all up at the same time type of thing. We have the knowledge to break down and, and, and present realistic and convincing plans that help save face, where should the government have to do a U-turn on certain things. And I think it's very critical that we don't get involved involved in the discussions that that basically um, um, uh, of the activists, the conversations that Monica was referring to just now. Um, there's enough out there already. There, there are cleverer people than us that understand the data, that are scientists that are proposing convincing arguments for changing the status quo. That's not our job. Our job is to work with the position of the government and try and accelerate the pace of opening up for tourism within that. That's the only way I think that we're going to successfully lobby for, um, for tourism to be on a different trajectory than it currently is. 
Margie, maybe you can speak to that more. I don't have experience working with government, but, but I have a sense that we want to stay away from that conversation. And I agree. So I also saw on this come, comment. Yeah, thanks. Uh, sorry, Javi. You know, we, we women take over. Um, so, so I do agree with, with Gavin's comments in, in, in terms of, of that, because the, the reality is, is that the, the big job is being done by the various different groups, and we see it in the media all the time. What we need to do as an industry is say, how can we move up the levels? So I've seen a lot of the comments in the chats. We start with intra-provincial intra and get that into level three and get freedom of movement going. There's a psychology happening here amongst the travelers as well. We've got to get, we know that the research is showing around the world that the first movement is in, in a hundred kilometer perimeter, uh, per, what's the word I want? Perimeter to your house. And therefore, so you get that going and you start the economy actually going. And at the same time, you're proofing the fact that you can do it in a, with appropriate social distancing, with appropriate safety measures, with the appropriate responsibility that comes with opening it up, not just to the traveler, but to our, our staff as well and to the holistic kind of offering of it. So you start intra-provincial, then you go into inter-provincial. All we want him to do is we want to move that up the curve. That's not going to keep the majority of my industry happy in the Western Cape when 80% of the tourism revenue is generated by international arrivals. But it will allow us to be able to move up that curve at a more rapid rate. If we try and take it all on and go flat out against where the government is positioning, we're going to get absolutely nothing, which I think was Monica's point in terms of where we're at. Yeah, I think it, if anybody else wants to come in on, on, on this whole sequencing thing of, of domestic, regional, and then international, because the point was made yesterday by, I think it was Dave Ryan, you know, intuitively that makes sense. But given the fact that um, our domestic economy was in recession before this, given the fact that, as I say, this is moving very quickly and, you know, the response, everybody responded. So most people probably got a, a March salary. Your April salary might be reduced. After this, we enter the retrenchments and layoffs. And people, and I'm talking here, you know, from working class right up to middle class people are not going to have disposable income. So although we, you know, we're thinking and talking, and then corporates, that whole corporate market is going to be doing what we're doing now and having Zoom chats. We're not going to jump on planes as, as we used to at the drop of a hat and fly down to Cape Town or Durban or, or you know, the like. So, the point Dave was saying is, yes, we've got to open it up and maybe we use it as a proofing thing, but we certainly can't rely on the, on domestic movement to sustain the whole tourism sort of industry. And I think it, it's incumbent on us to, to as you said, um, Margie, let's start with that. Let's prove it. But what we need to add to that equation, which I think has been missing in, if you have a look at the um, South African tourism, the initial work that they did and there their four slide thing that CISA shared, and also it was, it was markedly absent in the presentation by the National Department to the Portfolio Committee, was this whole area that at some stage it, there will be demand from international tourists to come to South Africa. So we've got to try and you know, sequence and factor, factor all these things in. But anybody else want to come in here? Monica, would, would, or Peter, you, 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 you come in. So I, so I just think it's an important point to, and, and Margie's spot on, you know, it's, it's actually not up to us. We can open up and be, we're ready to go, but what does the consumer feel? How does, how does the, the guest feel? Are they actually willing to get on a flight? So even if flights are open, so it's, in my view, it's got to be a gradual, a gradual process. And, you know, if you read some of this, the stuff about China, it started with a hundred kilometer radius and then 300 kilometer radius, and then it was a flight. So it's a gradual process. Um, it's not just, um, you know, let's, everything's open now. If there's no confidence, no one's going to, no one's going to be, be, be traveling. So, um, I think that's, that's the first part. I think the second part, uh, is that domestic is, yes, everybody talks about domestic. It's not the solution, but it's part of the solution because it does get, if you think of hotels and operations, you know, we've also got to get used to how do we operate? So, you know, if you've got a little domestic market, sort of a practice run, you know, respectfully, but you, you've got to get used to this new normal. And in terms of developing the protocols and all, that's already been done, you know, and I don't think we don't need to go and, you know, be Europe. It's already been done. So why, why waste our energy on it? It's, it's uh, you know, take, take the good from it, maybe tweak it a bit to what you're about 
And um, you know, there's there's no need to spend huge amounts of energy and cost trying to develop your own protocols for for health and safety when it's been done all over the world already. And they're far cleverer people to do it than than certainly I'll put my hand up. Um, so you know, let let them do it. But but domestic is the start. It's not the solution, but it's certainly part of the. It's part of it. Great. Anybody else? For a... Julian. Yes. Yeah. David, I think I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of you know the fact that things are changing so quickly, and to set a timeline that is almost a year out, is is an unproductive move in the sense that it reminds me a little bit of the the Cape Town water crisis when the day zero was introduced. You know that was something that the international media picked up on, international tourists picked up on, and said Cape Town's running out of water. Why bother going there? Why take away the water from the locals? And I just feel that something like this, where it's been, you know, the timeline has been set so far out, is going to have a negative effect on, on, um, you know, the the recovery purely because not only just from an economic point of view, but just from a, a PR point of view. I think you will find that international media will start picking up on that, and um, and consumers will start reading about it. And I just think it's 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 a big negative. Anybody want to follow this strand? Because I want to just move on to talk a little bit around, um, you know, just following on from what you said, Julian. Lana's got her hand up, Bobby. Who's uh, sorry, Lana? Yeah. Can you Lana? <coughs> yeah. So uh, I agree completely with what Peter has said in terms of opening up and, and let's start opening up domestic tourism slowly. It gives us a great platform for, for trialing these new reinvented products. We are going to have a very different consumer and there's been a lot of research done on that. You know, that we know that they are going to be more health conscious. We have to look at health and hygiene and safety protocols within our products. Uh, we know that our consumer is going to be a lot more cautious uh, from their, their buying decisions to which destinations they choose. He's going to be a lot more cautious. He's also going to be a lot more demanding. Um, <clears throat> we, um, you know, we, we've seen this. Are our people ready to deal with, you know, a more emotional traveler who is more who's demanding more from us in terms of safety, in terms of how close our waitering staff come. Um, and we know that people are seeking experiences and not destinations. So, you know, domestic tourism can be our trial run. It can be our proof to government that we do have the policies and protocols in place to deal with this. Um, you know, that we can handle tourism and open up without there being negative effects. So I think that, you know, domestic tourism, there is a space for, um, and we do need to try and get that opened up as soon as we can. Yeah, and I mean, it obviously, you know, one of the key aspects here is aviation. And uh, I mean, just intuitively, when you think about aviation, I mean, it's a, a highly regulated uh, activity anyway, and it's, it's regulated around safety. So if you just have to introduce a, another element, which is around sort of compliance on COVID to that, it should be easily done. And, you know, I'm just, you know, when I think back and I just sit back and this is just me, you know, we can't, you know, obviously everything's been shut down, but you know, the airline saying let's let's start flying domestically. Namibia's opened up its airspace, um, but that's being sort of no. You keep your planes on the ground, and then we think, what is the most unregulated, unsanitized, unsafe uh, part of Icona? Well, it's the taxi industry. You guys open up and just go for it. So you know, to my mind, there is some crooked and muddled thinking here, but it's not our job, I think, to second guess. It's our job to put a reasoned and data-driven argument on the table. Margie, do you want to get back to um, the, the sort of aviation side of things and just, you know, you, you had some initial comments on that, but just expound on that and, and why that, that, is, that is key and so important. So I, just, I, I do want to just share a bit of a story because it's, it's everybody's story. Everything changes every day. And I can't remember, I think it was, is it five weeks now? How long have we been in lockdown, Mr. President? Do you think he'll wear his like three quarter pants with boots? in terms of our new clothing regulations. And I love them, so don't say anything. Um, when we started repatriation, I understand that 85% of the um, tourists were in the Western Cape that got repatriated. So when we started the repatriation process, 
this is just anecdotal because it shows how neurotic everybody was about airports and, and, and air travel. Um, we were allowed one flight out every five hours because of the protocols that had to go in place. When we got to realize that there were three and a half thousand tourists in the Western Cape that needed to be repatriated in a two week period, um, Cape Town International completely reinvented itself overnight. By day three, we were putting out four flights a day, one from international departures, one from international arrivals, one from domestic departures, one from in, um, domestic arrivals. And the protocol and, and it went from being a six hour process down to even quicker than a normal departure. So, so we learned fast and what Cape Town International has already done is put all the protocols in place for touchless travel and is ready to, to, to put that in place. So you've got to have some confidence in the fact that we can react well and react efficiently and can deliver in those numbers. And cargo flats, which were not allowed, which were shut down for a portion of, of level five, are flying all the time. Initially, the crews weren't allowed to disembark. Now the crews, crews are disembarking and going into um, self-isolation designated accommodation. So we've got progress happening. So I keep thinking, I, I keep getting concerned about aviation because if you knew, when you talk those kind of elements, everyone's very comfortable. As soon as you throw in the tourist word, it switches everyone off because it's seen as high risk. And yet we are showing how we are flying people and product uh, and big people in terms of repatriation, both back and in safely and effectively. However, there are um, a number of issues, and I've seen John asking questions the whole time about what are we seeing, what are we projecting for the, for the um, summer season. And at this stage, we're not projecting anything, and that's one of the big issues, and that's the debate that you had yesterday in terms of saying we're not projecting it, you know, uh, consumer travel over, for this period. So how do we get that right, and how do we work with someone like the Cape Town Air Access Team, which is a fantastic initiative, to try and lobby and de-risk this whole thing. And, and I know I just introduced it now, but there is, there is a conversation to be had about running, even if it's one frequency a week, sooner rather than later, to show how we have changed the entire travel journey and show, because I, I don't know who it was, but somebody said yesterday that there are 60 Germans who are wanting to come in July uh, in a group. And I know that I've seen some of the comments on, on the groups. Can we not find a way to actually just test run this runway, Darby? Can we not actually find a way of doing it and saying in showing that we can show how we keep all the required safety and security health hygiene factors in control because otherwise if you look at the conventional the current scenarios it's only in the advent of a vaccine that we are going to truly open up and that's untenable for us as an industry from a timing perspective no no you make some good points there just to just a thought that comes to mind, and Natalia, I might just, I'm just going to throw this across to you, because in order, you know, let's we'll take a step back. I mean, firstly, we've got a, is there demand? So, you know, we're hearing, hopefully, from Julian that there, there will be demand out of, out of our key source markets. You know, are airlines willing to, to travel? I think intuitively the answer is yes. I mean, Qatar, I think, is announcing they want to fly to 80 destinations in June. And then can we do it safely? But my question, Natalia, you, I know you do a lot of work with Otto and Asata. This is only going to be viable if we've got South Africans and business travel ex-South Africa back to these destinations. We can't just put this on and hope the, the economics is all on, on inbound into South Africa. I mean, briefly, because I think this is where we start needing to sort of um, just uh, talk to the other work groups that we're hoping to set up. You know, what's the view from, from, from Asata's point of view in terms of outbound travel out of South Africa? So most of the outbound travel that um, is ex-South Africa is corporate travel. And that's, that's pretty much been a, a big focus um, for Asata and its members. And essentially the argument is made, and, and Monica actually touched on it earlier, where she said we're all interconnected. So we have these essential services opening up, but... You can't open up parts of the travel industry. You've got to open up everything. And if you are opening up these essential um, services, these businesses, they need uh, elements of travel to be able to do their jobs properly. And I don't know the extent to which that is actually considered. You can't open up car rental and then not open up domestic airlines, for example. You can't open up some businesses, essential services, and not have a travel industry to support the essential services operations. 
you, you know, you need travel agents and travel management companies to facilitate that travel. You can't have large corporates booking their travel directly with airlines, with accommodation establishments. There are processes that need to be put in place. So the focus has very much been around lobbying government through the Tourism Business Council again, um, to try and get support not only from uh, the perspective of uh, length, uh, at least limiting that runway, but also looking at the key pain points that travel agents are experiencing around airline refunds, which is the largest pain point currently uh, for outbound travelers, where airlines have not refunded um, the amounts and they think that the travel agents are essentially sitting on those refunds. And those are the two areas of lobbying at the moment. Julian, do you want to come in just on... on you know, because the other the other interconnected bit is that, you know, a lot of travel um, or a lot of tourism, leisure tourism that, that uh, comes through South Africa also goes into the region. We, you know, our airports are are, are, are sort of hubs into, into the sort of Southern Africa region. And I mean, you made the point earlier, if other parts of South and East Africa sort of open up and we remain closed, we, there's a risk that we start losing that because uh, those um, that those travel travel patterns become established, um, and uh, you know how important is us? You know, or, or put it this way: How are we seen from the U.S. point of view? Um, because I think intuitively, once again, we should have been working a lot more closely together. But it's something that, and I don't know if it's the DMO mindset, uh, Monica and, and Marx. Maybe you can speak to that. But you know, we. I just don't see much public sector discourse between, say, SA Tourism, um, the Namibian Tourism Board, the Botswana Tourism guys, in terms of, you know, a regional sort of offering. And I mean, and I was saying yesterday, is this something that we should just be pushing ahead with from a private sector point of view and talking to our, our counterparts in, in, in countries like that, as well as Tanzania and Kenya? But Julian, just a perspective on, on that side of it. Yeah, I think, um, you know, from, from the American perspective, I think I would say the overwhelming majority of, of trips that are booked to the region are covering several countries, not, not just South Africa individually and not just Botswana individually and so on. So I think it's vitally important that, um, you know, there is discussion, whether it's at the private sector level or at government level, that, that the, the region talks together about reopening and, and making things happen. Because, I, and I think even going forward, you know, just from a marketing perspective, I think it would be worth um, everybody, all the countries, um, you know, benefit, it would be to all the countries benefit to, to be marketing collectively as a region. Because from the US, it is perceived as a regional trip, regional sell, and not just an individual country sell. Can I, can I, I mean, the very useful stuff, um, that we've done done up to now, but let's let's get back to Alana. Um, if I could go back to you, Alana, we've got uh, sort of roughly half an hour left, and I want to I want to get into um, move slightly away from the sort of lobbying and the message that we need to get through, because I think we've I think we've got some really good points today, and it's just great that we we we've touched on the aviation side. But let's get back to you know whilst we're doing all of this, what else should and could we be doing? Um, you had some thoughts around how uh, tourism might look quite different. Um, we need to focus on on, on our customers and, and, and take cognizance of that. And then, guys, let's broaden it into, um, you know, before this whole thing uh, uh, sort of transpired, we, we'd done some really good things in the Garden Route and uh, the Western Cape. Peter, you did the, put together a couple of mega fams with Wesgro. We, we want to look at seeing whether we can roll these out to other parts of and you know, couldn't should we be looking at these things whilst whilst our, our lobbying efforts um, sort of go ahead? But let's kick off. Oh, have we lost David? Looks yeah, like so it's you, Lana. You, Lana. <laughs> <laughs> maybe even black. You know. Um, and, and I think going back to the timelines, our booking period is going to open up long before then. And I think it's important that as businesses, we are ready for that, that our reservations um, and documentation systems are ready for that, that we've got 
connectivity on product, that we've got 2021 rates in the system, um, and that we use this opportunity to fix um, to fix the things that we can. Um, and we've got a very robust strategy in terms of uh, loading our 2021 rates, getting our connectivity, our APIs um, all up and running and ready so that when we do start opening up in, in various markets, we can start selling. Um, we're finding from our customers, a lot of them want training. They want our systems training. They want to start interacting more with our, with our online tools. Um, so, you know, training is important for us, getting up to speed with all of our systems, making sure that we've got partnerships um, in, in place, that we are ready to roll, that we know hygiene and health protocols are going to be at the foremost. But how do we... You know, how do we reinvent the product? How do we how do we approach you know the number of people in vehicles from a touring perspective? I mean, a, a traditional group tour that had 30, 40 people on it, is it now going to have 15, 20 people on the coach? And how do we deal with that? Are we gonna to have to have two coaches? Um, is it gonna see a difference in product? If is it going to end up being more experiential? Um I think there's so many considerations there. Um, I've been sort of talking about contactless check-in. If we can get somebody clever who can develop a, an app that everybody can use, A, it saves paper. It's, there must be so many ideas. We're so brilliant as that as South Africans in coming up with, with new initiatives and ideas and inventions. And we saw it recently with the water crisis um, we've got incredible minds out there. So what are those ideas um, and how can we reinvent our product, be very customer centric, be sensitive to this cautious traveler? You know, we need to look at our, we need to look at our contracts. We need to look at deposit policies, payment policies, penalty policies, um, understand our customer. And without a customer, we don't have a recovery. Um, so we can start gearing towards that now. Um, and the sooner we can open up our booking periods, um, the better, along with, of course, uh, an opening of, of air access, which is, is the first critical point to international export tourism. Lana, thanks. So Peter and Margie, before I come to you, Julian, let me just throw one, just, just feeding off that, because I'm looking at some comments, and I think it's Gisela, you made, you know, was sort of asking around, you know, can we not look at a more flexibility, more flexibility around cancellations and, and 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 deposits? And then the other one that we touched on when we had our chat with you the other night, um, which is obviously going to be key for everybody. What about pricing? Um, you know, intuitively, you'll always say you want it cheaper. People here will always try and preserve their rates, but you know, do just go out and discount madly? Um, is that the way forward? So just just some thoughts feeding off, off, off what Alana said, and then uh, Malti and Peter, I'll come I'll come come on to you after this. Yeah, I think in terms of pricing, I think um, you know the rand to a certain extent with the devaluation of the rand that that has taken care of of pricing for twenty one, I think, and but I do also agree that you know now's not the time to increase prices. I, I'm not suggesting discounting necessarily. Perhaps if the country opened up earlier than expected, perhaps have some some type of discounting for the remainder of this year just to try and fill some beds. But I think the fact that many people have postponed into 21 um, and then you would all obviously have, you know, new new potential clients for 21 as well. I think nobody's really going to have a, a major problem in terms of, um, you know, available beds and so on. So I don't foresee any reason to be discounting in 21. Um, but also the whole world is going to be hungry for tourism. So, you know, by increasing prices too much, potentially you, you, you know, losing a lot of business to other markets around the world. Also, in terms of um, what Ilana said, um, you know, I think it's really important that, that you understand uh, the market. The, one of the things that I, I would really like to see, and I know this is a sort of a pipe dream, but Right now, predominantly, um, 
most most suppliers have a cancellation policy whereby at around 60 days it goes from somewhere around 20 percent to maybe 40 or 50 percent cancellation um, which realistically means that we as foreign tour operators have to start suggesting postponements and and making moves to to move clients into the following year clients that are scheduled for travel in august we are now already having to to move Whereas if we're able to take that down to 30 days and retain the 20% cancellation, we're just buying time. We have a better opportunity. Things may turn as, you know, as we discussed, things are changing very rapidly. And if things do start opening up, let's not lose that market that, that's scheduled to go. Let's try and hold them for as long as we possibly can before we make them postpone or before they decide to postpone uh, for the future. So, um, you know, if we could get some sort of broad consensus on that, I honestly think that would, would help us to retain some business potentially for this year, depending on how things uh, evolve. Um, Monica, Gav, do you guys want to come in on, on, on pricing cancellation issues before we move on to, on to some regional marketing initiatives? Um, I just, thanks, David. I just made the comment actually in the chat to someone there. Um, Ilana actually did um, an opinion piece that SATSA distributed, I think two weeks ago or so, Lance. Um, and she very um, succinctly outlined, I think, a, a really good st strategy, a suggestion around pricing developments for 2020. Um, certainly at Private Safaris, and I'm sure I can speak for pretty much all of the DMC um, sister companies around the world, uh, or in, around the country, um, we've had to put the majority of our staff on short time and some on um, uh, temporary unpaid leave. So we're a little shorthanded at the moment. The easiest thing for, for the industry, I think, is if um, suppliers simply hold their rates over from 2020 to 2021, because from a processing perspective, it's the easiest thing to do. Um, the second thing I just want to kind of amplify um, what Julian has said, and I think Ines in yesterday's call also very succinctly put it, um, we want to try and make sure that our, our customers have as much peace of mind when they travel to South Africa as possible. And peace of mind isn't only about health and safety protocols. It's also about if you, you know, if you get stopped at the Frankfurt airport because you test positive for COVID-19, you should be able to know that you're not going to get penalized by the supplier um, for not being able to consume your, your travel. Um, there needs to be a degree of flexibility around the terms and conditions. But I think, Peter, you've got, you've got some, you had some conversation, we had a conversation about that yesterday, actually. So you, maybe you'll see you want to come in here because that's actually kind of your area, right? Unmute. <laughs> Sorry, throw me into the pricing debate. Eh? Um, I, I just want to go back. There's two things. So one is, um, before we even talk about pricing, I think there's two elements we need to consider. One is, and let's not forget about the guest. So, you know, I think Julian touched on it earlier. So certainly in the, in the foreseeable, or foreseeable future anyway, maybe generally speaking, the client is probably going to be younger. Okay, so what does that mean for any tourism operation? So do we need to rethink our product in terms of, and how do we market to a younger generation for the next two years, three years, whatever it might be. Then the, the, the second thing, I think generally guests are gonna be more a millennial focused in the way they behave. So they want flexibility, they want experiential, and they want community social responsibility projects to feel good about. Okay, so as, as products, we gotta start thinking about that and we gotta start asking ourselves questions if we're not meeting some of those criteria what do we need to do to maybe tweak to make sure that we are appealing for a for a future customer a future customer and then the second element to that is which julian and ilana have alluded to is is we need to be connecting with our trade partners so what are their pressure points and understanding where they at at the same time we we also have our you know our, our limitations um pricing you know, we've, we've got to go and buy new PPE equipment. We've got sanitizers to fund and all those kind of new costs that come in. So it's not always just about discounting and cutting rates. I have a different view on that. And maybe that's for a different, different discussion. So, but back to, it's to the trading terms. It, it, you know, if I have silly terms, no one's going to book with me in the first place. And it's not about Ilana or Monica. It's about what the guest feels who's sitting in New York or Philadelphia or wherever the, the case might be. But at some point, there's got to be a line where Monica and I disagree with you slightly because if a guest gets stops at 
at the airport, you know, tomorrow I've got no one in the bed. So somewhere between there's a period of time where you've got to be fair to me as well to say, okay, if you're not going to commit to it, then at least allow me to resell it to someone else who is willing to pay for it. And I think these are those kind of discussions that we need to have hammered out now or in the next six months, two months, whatever it might be, so that when the plan takes off, that this is all clear. And it's a, it's a message that we can take to the world and say, you know, this is, he has an opinion on South Africa. This is how we're perceiving it. And it's confidence, it's certainty, because no one's going to book if they're uncertain. And I agree with that. I agree with that completely. But at some point also, there's a line that says, okay, I'm going to commit. I'm going to put my money down. Because as a, as a hotel or a lodge, I've still got costs to cover. I've got people to pay. I've got a business to run as well. So there's, there's always two sides to the coin. But I think it's got to be reasonable and it's got to be um, you know, fair to, to, both, to both parties. And I think we've come a long way. And I said right at the beginning, it's tourism unusual. So I do agree with Ilana that you know, it's only days you had such a percent and so only days you have such a percent. Well, pay a deposit. Maybe it's 100, 100% refundable. But at some point, you're going to say if you are cancelled within what that time period will be, depending how big the group is or how many rooms you have, and 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 that there will be a commitment that um, you're going to be be paid for that for that booking, and then and I know it cancellation fees and it all becomes semantics. You know, if it's penalties or cancellation fees, we might change the wording, but there's still there's still a cost to hold a booking for the future, and there's got to be a way that that can be confirmed to a supplier as well. Thanks, David. Thanks so much. Um, Margie, I'm going to hang it because you've also got a quick comment on, on, on the pricing thing. But I just want to say that, that that opinion piece Alana wrote then was followed up by a number of other quite, quite useful perspectives. And as Satsa next week, towards the end of next week, we, we want to set up a little mini in Darba um, uh, where we try and bring all elements of the value chain together on the back of all the opinions and start sort of facilitating some sort of dialogue around this, but we under time constraints. So Margie, quick comment on pricing. And then if you could just carry straight on to talk about the, uh, the sort of mega fam type ideas and, and whether we can you know, carry on with our partnership in a virtual world. Because I am just cognizant, Gab, I do see your hand, but I'm just cognizant that we, we need to get to some questions as well. So let's just, let's just hear from you, Margie, and then we'll, we'll see if, we, if, we've, if we've got enough time to to uh, come back to you, Gav. Mogs, over to you. Okay, so I'll try and be quick because I'm sticking to the theme of pricing, but I'm taking it to a slightly different place. Um, those of you that have worked with me and know the tourism funnel, we know that we lose 51% of potential arrivals to, help, uh, to risk, to safety, safety and security. And that figure is going to increase dramatically because now health risk will increase it exponentially. But the next highest factor is, is um, airlift, is the cost of the, the, we lose the next 50 because of the cost of the um, long haul flight. And I know that all the pressure has been put on me as running a DMO to say, the devaluation of the rand is fabulous for you. You can really position South Africa as very affordable. My concern is that before our potential traveler even looks at how affordable it is in South Africa, it's the cost of getting here. With the collapse of the airline economy, and with the high cost of de-risking airline travel, that long haul cost is going to go up. So I don't have an answer for it, but I just do need to flag it. It will have a significant impact because we know what an important lever it is on us. Okay, so I'm sorry, I don't have the answers, but that's all the more reason why we need a really strong air access team to be able to work with the, the international flights. Um, and I won't even mention SA because I'll be here for a while. Um, Adabi, I'm very happy to talk. We have a relationship with SATSA. We entered into it at the, last of our, uh, at the end of our last fiscal, which was incredibly valuable because our budgets are being cut. Um, SA Tourism's budget was cut by 70%. We were waiting for our cut. It will be in the same region. It's going to make moving into recovery difficult, but not impossible because we can find ways to be really smart about how we actually position what is a great product. So we will move forward with SATSA. How we... We'd love your input. Do we do it virtually? Um, um, do we? I just had Hanley on, on, on a call. She was saying, do we wait until we actually open up and be brave enough to show that we as the tourism sector are prepared to travel and take the lead in traveling to show how, what a safe sector it is, which I really liked. And it was a point that came up yesterday as well. Let's lead in that way. But we certainly, for the entire Western Cape, and it's not just the Garden Repeater, 
you did such a good job last year that we're taking it to all all of our regions and taking sets on that roadshow to showcase all of our regions and we will do it we will find a way to do it the last point i very briefly want to make because i know that you're aware of timing darby is that the one thing that we have there have been a lot of comments about we are still in survival mode we know that government fiscus is strained and it's going to um health and education so the the in fact my the team just messaged me the the west Coast investment team are really smart and what i've asked them to work on is to look at how we can take um private equity kind of venture capital maybe even debt funding and package something for, or for potential interested private equity kind of funders to work particularly in the tourism um, sector to look particularly at the tourism sector because I know that a couple of you in the conversations I've had have had approaches, but I tend to call them the, the kind of the um, hyena type approaches. They're waiting for the businesses to be stripped out completely before they hop onto them and then wait, package them down, wait for the industry to be rebuilt, which we know it will. We have a great product. I mean, none of us have said that today. We say it all the time. South Africa, the Western Cape, is a great product. It's perfect post-COVID in terms of its wide open spaces and its offerings. But I just wanted to mention that because we are really trying hard to find alternate funding solutions in what we know is a very cash strapped and very balance sheet wiped out, <laughs> to put it very um, in great financial lingo. Um, and so we are working on that. And as soon as we ha have something to share with you, which will be in the next week or so, we will share it. So that is some good news at least. Brilliant, thank you, Margie. Really encouraging to to know that there's some developments there. Natalia, we've got 15 minutes left. I'll try to uh, get the trains to run on time. Um, so you're going to pick some of the more interesting questions and uh, you're just going to throw them at whoever you think is uh, best equipped to handle it. So over to you. Thank you. There's been such great feedback on the chat, so please keep it coming because we're going to be collating everything that has come um, up on the chat as well. We have had quite a few uh, questions. So um, I will I'll pull Erna out. Speaking of booking period, a question that concerns me, having seen the flip-flopping on lockdown regulations so far, is that whatever opening date is decided on needs to be a firm date that is not postponed after being announced. No planning or marketing or flight bookings can be done in a climate of uncertainty if there is any risk that the date may be pushed out again after being announced. So if we're aiming for the 1st of September or the 1st of October in order not to miss the summer season, how do we put together a convincing argument for the TBCSA and ensure the date stays certain and is not changed again after being announced? And Innes uh, actually highlighted that yesterday as well, where she said we needed to be very clear exactly what that date was, even if it was a date that we didn't particularly like. Uh, let's see, who can I pose that one to? Let me actually go to Julian. Julian, would you agree in your market that that is something that would assist to sell South Africa, having a specific date in place so that we can manage expectations? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. <clears throat> it, it's, it's not something, it's kind of between a rock and a hard place, really. It's, it's setting a, you know, a, a date for opening, which, you know, in some case could be unrealistic, like I believe, you know, the current date is, but you also don't want to set a date that is going to be also unrealistic in terms of it's just not going to happen. And therefore we run into issues with, you know, clients that are already booked for these, the, you know, these dates when suddenly they're not able to come anymore. So yeah, I totally agree. There has to be a, 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 a date that has been set that is going to be stuck to, you know, through thick or thin. Peter, I see you nodding from a supplier perspective. Um, is that something that you feel confident to be able to communicate to your customers now, having a fixed date? I mean, you must be looking at when you're allowed to reopen. What are you telling customers? Yeah, it's like renovations. You never know when the builders are going to be finished. <laughs> um, I'm just thinking from our point of view, we've got lots of bookings in the system. So, you know, bookings have been moved or postponed or deferred. So it's, there's this continuous, I need to move it again, or I need to move it again. So of course, certainty creates, you know, great, I have a date, I know what I'm planning to, and I know what I'm working towards. So that's absolutely first prize. But, but how realistic is it in, in what we're dealing with? I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. No, difficult one to answer. Hmm. 
Okay, I'm going to give this one to Ilana. Anybody who wants to weigh in on it, you, you know where your raise hand button is, so I'll feel, let you put that up if you want to comment. Um, and that was from Linda, who wants to know, Ilana, what is the norm in the industry going forward with regards to refundable deposits and payments, i.e. relaxed cancellation policy, as we have found clients want to book, but only with these policies in place. And we've seen that prolifically on the chat as well, talking about, you know, how can we as a destination be customer friendly and put those flexible policies in place? Is that something that we can market around? Do you have a comment on that? Um, yeah, I do. Uh, and, I, and I think, honestly, that, that really is a non-negotiable. Um, I have been having amazing discussions literally daily with suppliers. Um, lots asking opinions, wanting to bounce new policies um, off us and have conversations around policies. But I think that, that your flexible policies um, have to be created in order to speak to that caution that these customers are, uh, um, customers and consumers are feeling. Um, everybody has, has felt pain through this. It's a highly emotional, highly emotional period as with any period of stress. Um, and, and we've seen varying reactions. So we've seen reactions from suppliers that have gone completely one way and that is now enforcing um, deposits, um, penalties from time of booking, non-refundable deposits, which in themselves are questionable um, around, you know, the legalities of, of, of using a deposit as a penalty. But uh, around those conversations, the, the consumer is not going to book unless there is flexibility in that policy, unless he knows that he is not going to feel pain. Um, and it might be painful for us to consider. Yeah, we want to. We want the guarantee. We want the commitment. We want to know, like every supplier, that you know we we we're not going to put our own businesses at risk. But the reality is that the consumer and the customer are not going to book with us unless these policies are flexible, um, and unless they speak to the caution that that consumer is now feeling with his now depleted um, luxury spend. And it is about building trust. I mean, that's what we're trying to do. Not only trust from a safety hygiene perspective, but trust that we are a customer friendly or a customer focused destination. So that would speak to that messaging, Lana. Yeah, absolutely. And we're certainly seeing there, there's, there's no confirmation for products that are asking for, that are insisting on penalties or that have terms related to a postponement that would be beyond their control. So I, I think it's really, really critical that we relook at those policies um, and, and, and we revise them, that they speak to a consumer and give them absolute trust and faith in booking with us because there's a hundred other destinations that are lining up to take that business at no risk. And we do that before we're about to take off as Peter pointed out earlier. Julian, you had your hand up. Did you want to comment? Yeah, I just want to, you know, say that I, I agree 100% with Ilana. Flexibility is absolutely key because one of the pressure points that we are experiencing at the moment is for the suppliers that are not flexible, we're running into issues where we have clients that are charging back on their credit cards with a, with a credit card company. And we are having to, to fight these, these chargebacks. And the credit card companies are starting to see us as a potential risk to their businesses. And as a result, and it's thankfully hasn't happened to me, but I know of colleagues in the industry that it's happened to already, is the, these merchant accounts are coming along and saying, we want surety. We want to know that you're going to remain in business. And as a result, we need $150,000 to $300,000 in cash to be given to us tomorrow so that we can hold that in surety in order to, for you to continue doing business. And if you don't have that amount of money to give to them, they will deduct anywhere from 10 to 30 percent of every transaction you make in order to get to that point and you know those types of things are what is going to sink businesses in the us and and um ultimately you know when when businesses go down in the us those businesses are no longer providing business to the suppliers in south africa so flexibility is key we'd have to be able to try and avoid these these chargebacks um, at all costs 
Thanks, Julian. There is a comment in the chat from Janine, if you wouldn't mind having a squiz um, and replying to her if you have an answer. But I see Gav's got his hand up. So Gav, you can unmute yourself and go for it. Well, if I can just... Sorry, go ahead, Gav. No, sorry, just a quick comment, Natalia. So obviously the pandemic will accelerate trends that were already reshaping business. If you think about um, manufacturing business, single sources, art diversification, and it'll, at the same time, it'll, it'll surface issues or dysfunctions or call them fault lines in, in, uh, in business. Um, and one of those might, be, might very well be the way that we've in the past structured our uh, cancellation uh, and payment policies. So to that end, I, I can see a future where, where we need to get more transparency and we need to get greater alignment all the way through the value chain from the, from the traveler to the final supplier. Um, and, and, I, and I can't see us not going there. Um, and and uh, the solutions are going to lie in our ability to think in new unconventional ways. And it comes back to that original conversation, my opening comment about forget the past. Things are not going to be the same as they were in the past. We need to think differently. Thank you, Gavin. Margie, um, you're up. So we had a, a question from John um, asking whether we believe there will be enough airlines flying into South Africa by our summer season. And also, what about outbound? Airlines do not, will not do inbound flights without sufficient outbound capacity. So yes, I think we've, we have addressed that. Um, I just want to touch on, before Margie uh, responds to that, there was a follow-up question around South African Airways and Comair uh, and closure or possible closure of SA and Comair. There are many airlines that are going into the business rescue currently um, to safeguard their assets. That does not mean that they're going to go under. They've just been very clever about their business strategy. So if somebody says they're going into business rescue, that does not mean to say that they are not going to be an airline flying in future. Just keep that in the back of your mind when you read the media articles, because I know everyone freaks out when they see business rescue. Business rescue does not mean closure. Just remember that. Margie, um, over to you. Do you think we will have enough airlines flying into South Africa by our summer season when everybody wants to come and visit us? <laughs> that was my equivalent to pleading the fifth. Um, John, I've been watching you. I've been watching your questions coming again and again and again. And it's a conversation from everyone. If I had a crystal ball, if you had an answer to that, we could make an enormous amount of money. I don't want to end this webinar on a depressing note, but we know where national government is looking at in terms of opening borders. And that is the only answer I can give you. So it's not a question of whether there'll be enough airlines open to, to, to come in for summer season. Right now, the, opening, the best case scenario is February 2021. So I don't, that's why I literally, I'd be very happy just leaving the picture. The penguins are more useful to you than me. And they're also Having said that, this whole, conversation, this whole conversation today is about how we can change that reality, or can we change that reality, or what is it that we can do to actually progress that reality, and what I'm hoping that comes out of this, and the summary that comes out of it, and Natalie, Natalia puts together great summaries and, and briefs as well, she's, a, she's brilliant. We're going to lend you to a couple of other webinar people I know, Natalia. In, in terms of how to run a, an interactive webinar, so thank you. But John, I, there is no answer to that. There literally is no answer to that. This is what we as a collective need to do. And you know, when I started, and David had asked for my opening comments, is what, what am I focused on? We are absolutely focused on air access and how we can collaborate. And I'm not talking from a Cape Town perspective, I'm talking from a country perspective of how we can make this work and how we can make it work with our airline partnerships that we have spent years developing. I can talk about SAA, but maybe I shouldn't, Darby. Don't. <laughs> Thank you. Don't. We want to end on a, on a good note. And um, I'm actually just going to, we've got all the questions in, and please keep sending those questions and commenting on the chat. As I said, we're going to pull all of this together and, and release it. Um, but I wanted to ask a question that I asked yesterday, David, and you answered it eloquently, but it's important to me that people who are on the webinar that perhaps are not SATSA members or are from a, an informal sector, for example, perhaps they're tourist guides, you know, they are part of this tourism economy. So how can we as SATSA, as the organization of SATSA, um, ensure that we are incorporating their voices um, in, in our feedback to the Tourism Business Council. If you wouldn't mind just addressing that um, again for me today, I'd really appreciate it. Thanks, Natalia. Yeah, and it's a good point to end on. So let me just thank 
everybody who has been here. Thanks, guys, for, for your time and your insights, your wisdom. Um, really, really, and, I, and I, you know, really been a useful session. And I think we're progressing the conversation and we're sharpening what um, our, our message needs to be. Um, look, this question does come up um, a lot, Natalia. Um, but I think Margie, you nailed it, where she said, you know, government is going to listen to a to the voice of an organized industry. Um, so that's why, you know, we've got the TBCSA. And in the mining industry, you've got the Chamber of Mines. You know, they don't represent every single mine in the country, but they represent the majority of, of, of mining interest, as does the Tourism Business Council through its association. It represents the majority of the industry. Now, what we're saying is we've had the webinar. If, if anybody attending the webinar, and I'm talking to members and non-members, wants to make a submission, and, and guys, you know, the best way to do this, as Margie said, if you're making a submission, and I think, make it two pages. Don't send us a thesis. Give us a two-page submission. Send it to communications at satsa.co.za. We need to collate all these inputs, and indeed we will. Um, there, were also, there was also um, an address set up by, I think, the TBCSA to, to do that. But what I want to do, uh, appeal to, is to people who are not members of SATSA or ASATA, whatever, there are other informal associations or other associations that have been set up. Um, and I hear a lot of clamoring around that. What would be useful is for these associations to put in a submission on behalf of the members that they uh, purport to represent, because that would strengthen the, uh, would, would certainly strengthen their argument. But, you know, it's, it's one of these things where we can't get everybody to the starting line before we sort of fire the gun and get the race underway. And you know what we need to do is to is to is to harness the collective voice um, of the industry, and that's the role that um, associations play. So it is in no way meant to be an exclusionary process. But as with all interactions between government and business, government will defer to the to the associations and the industry bodies that represent uh, the majority of of that sector. And I mean, it's the old union principle: fifty plus one is my vice chair told me today. So we, we, we will take the conversation forward, but there certainly has been space created for people who are not part of, of, of the formal sector. And guys, we look forward to, to, to receiving your submissions. So thanks very much for everything. And Natalia, thanks once again for your steady hand on the tiller through the webinar. Lovely superpower that you've developed. Thank you to all of you for logging in today and for, for sharing so generously. And please remember to send that to communications at satsa.co.za. I am acutely aware that I'm keeping you from wine, dinner, coffee, catch-ups, et cetera, et cetera. I do hope that you will join our Western Cape and Garden Route coffee catch-ups um, in a second. And we are recording this and we'll release it hopefully by tomorrow. So keep a lookout for that. And hopefully we will see you on a webinar soon. Thank you again and have a lovely evening and stay safe. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, guys.